Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ahkam SOS, the show that discusses Islamic duties and practices by His Eminence, the Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi. Inshallah, this season we'll be also looking at different other maraja and their verdicts on these topics as well. And we'll be doing that with Sheikh Ali Ma'ar. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikhna. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi How are you? Alhamdulillah. Sheikhna, I've, I've got a, a, well, a question here from an individual. Now, it is regarding an immoral act. He says, if one is unmarried and is of intense sexual desires that he cannot fulfill, what are the means to drive away or diminish the cravings of those desires? Allah if an individual feels that he is falling into the haram conduct, that he might commit haram, let's say uh, by watching indecent movies, indecent uh, photographs, pornography, and so forth, in this case, the fatwa is by the Sayyid is that it is uh, obligatory for that individual to marry, to get married as soon as possible. Now, as a fixed term or long term, temporary or long term, at the end of the day, he must get married to overcome this desire. It is a godly created desire in every inner self of human being. It's part of the instinct and fitra. Um, so the one should uh, seek um, the support and the advice of the elderly in order to uh, offer him and, and, and support him in, in terms of getting married. Um, otherwise, if there's no way and there's no solution for that, the one should fast. And fasting is the last resort because fasting would eliminate and minimize the desires in overall. That's why in month Ramadan, you see uh, people are. Uh, in more calmness and in, in more uh, peacefulness, they would uh, tend to uh, respect each other more and more, help each other more and more, invite each other in the uh, iftar, for example, read dua together, Quran, and so forth, attend majalis. So fasting would help that individual to overcome mm -hmm. or minimize these uh, demanding desires. Ahsan. I think the main issue here with with you know people uh, that you know aren't married and people who have such desires is is number one is the discipline and also the benefits um, of of what they say you know wasting your seed um, you know the, the benefits of refraining from that and the benefits of um, you know staying away from such uh, haram acts they you know psychologically and, and and physically there's so much benefits in it and I, if, if if any of the viewers are suffering from uh, such issues. Please look into the benefits of uh, you know refraining from these acts and see how um, more healthy your lifestyle could be. Sheikh, my next question is in regards to an individual who has taken some money. Okay, so the, the individual has taken some money in order to either invest it and, and profit from it. Now, I, I said the word taken. Let's use the word stolen. So, an individual maybe he, he works in a shop or he works in a bank. And he's stolen some money, a thousand pounds, and he's going to invest it and do something with it so that he can make a little bit of money on top uh, and then, uh, you know, um, return the money. Now, is this halal or haram for him to do? If he's got the intention of returning the money, what if he doesn't make any profit? Can he return to his company and say that, oh, this is what I've done. I, you know, I stole some money for this purpose. It didn't work out. I can't afford to pay it back. Um, you know, should he confess to what he has done, uh, even if his job is under jeopardy and that he could lose his job? Um, he is obliged to return the money back to its owners, be it the bank or the shopkeeper or the individual who he took the money from without their knowledge. And that by itself, that's haram act. You know, you cannot take other people's properties without permission. It becomes like a ghasub, like you said. So it's important that uh, such money or wealth is returned to its owners. There is no need for that individual to confess in front of those uh, that he took their money, 
uh, that I did such and such, you know, that was wrong thing to do, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, no, the one should confess between himself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You confess before Allah on what you did as wrongdoings, sins, uh, and, and such uh, undesirable acts. And of course, to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you would never do such a thing again. This is what calls it as tawbah nasuha. So it should be a true tawbah, a genuine tawbah and repentance by going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and making the oath that I will not commit such a wrongful act in the future. Ahsan. Shaykhna, education is a very, very important part of our lives and uh, education arguably is something that, you know, we never stop investing in. Now, considering university, which we hope all our viewers have been to and we encourage all our viewers that, you know, you study to a minimum of at least university level. Um, sometimes university can be a place not of the highest standard of morals, not of the highest standard of etiquette. Um, and, you know, God knows what goes on behind closed doors at university. Is this, you know, considering, taking that into consideration, should we still send our kids to uh, get higher education? There is no objection with regard to um, encouraging our youth to go and study. This is something encouraged in Islam. Uh, in the Holy Quran, in the narrations, the hadith, to encourage uh, the believers to go and study and seek knowledge. Um, however, the one should uh, protect himself from the haram, to avoid the haram. In case of the youth, we try to educate them from the early ages, um, to tell them what haram is and what, and what is wajib, for example. So you educate, you educate your uh, children and, and eventually when they become youth, the what is haram and what is wajib. So when they go to the college or university, they, are, they have some kind of immunity, protection from the act of sin. They know the red lines of sharia. So inshallah, they won't be falling into the haram. Uh, as far as there is a good education and mentoring by the parents and by even the friends uh, in the community and to try to uh, meet their demands, their needs, if they are in trouble or in, or in need of something, we try to help them and not to neglect and leave them alone in the society. I think the, you know, a lot of people are naive and, you know, they, we need to understand that in the real world, we don't live in an Islamic society full of moral and etiquettes and that one day... Um, people will be exposed to it. Now, whatever age that is, unfortunately, sometimes it's too young, unfortunately, sometimes it's too old, but they still need to be exposed to what is what sort of world we live in. And I think university is the greatest um, time to actually test what you have learnt and to see the reality and to see the beauty within Islam. It's an, it's an amazing experience. Sheikhna, when someone says salam to you, uh, to ahkam, it is wajib to reply. Even in your salah, if you're praying salah and someone says salam, you should stop uh, your dhikr, reply to the salah, and can then carry on with your salah. If I get, when I get a telephone call and someone says salam alaikum to me over the phone, should, is it wajib for me to reply to that salam? Yes, even over the phone, if someone says salam alaikum, you have to reply. By either saying salam alaikum or alaikum salam. And of course, the one who initiates the salam, starts the salam, has more, he gets more reward than the one who, who responds. The hadith says that the one who initiates the salam, he gets 69 hasana. And the one who responds, he gets one hasana. Wow. So some ulama used to uh, start the salam before anyone would say salam to them. So they, they try to initiate the salam to get that reward. Mm -hmm. So it's a good opportunity for the one to spread the salam as in the hadith, ifsha'u salam to spread the salam within uh, the believers, within the, uh, the, the community. Sheikh, now, earlier we discussed, uh, you know, in regards to money and uh, using money without someone's permission. Can a husband 
use his uh, his wife's money without her permission. Now I know Sayyid Sistani has a fatwa on this. What does the Sayyid say in regards to a husband using the wife's money without her permission? Sayyid Sistani would mention that it is not allowed to use the money of the wife without her permission. However, some Sayyid has a similar answer to this, that um, it is allowed if there's a mutual agreement. So they okay. both agreed to use, let's say, each other's money from both sides. And um, you get, if, if the husband gets the, uh, the uh, river and the acceptance of the wife, then he can use the money in, in all matters, you know, to spend it in trouble, in business, in food and drink, clothing, and so forth. However, without this consent from the other side, then it is not allowed. Interesting. Sheikh, when someone says Salamu Alaikum, uh, you know, gives the greeting, is it permissible for me to respond to that person without the, using the word Salam? Is that okay? Can I use a different greeting? What if the person who said Salam to me is not even a Muslim? Maybe it's a Christian or uh, you know, a Sikh or a Hindu, but understands that I'm a Muslim and this is how we greet one another. You know, do I use a different greeting or not? The wajib is to respond, as I mentioned earlier, the salam with the same phrase, salamu alaykum or alaykum as salam. You have to mention the salam within okay. uh, the response of the salam. And uh, you can't use, let's say, you know, hi as a response to the salamu alaykum. Or in, let's say, in some Arab countries, hala, they say, for example, uh, as a response to salamu alaykum. You have to respond with uh, the salam it has to be there with the response. For the non-Muslims, you can say, if they, I mean, if they say salam alaikum to you, it would say alaikum. Or you can just use hi and hello as, as usual. Sheikh, when, you know, in, in today's uh, world that we live in, uh, I see a lot of the brothers, they just say salam. And the reply also sometimes is salam. They say salam, salam, like this. Is that, uh, you know, is that good enough? Is that sufficient? Or do we have to say the alaykum as well? So Matt said would mention that it is sufficient to just say salam. Um, and this is very well common in, in Iran that people, some of them would say salam. Um, however, the Sayyid says it's better to um, respond the salam with better uh, greeting as the Quran mentions. So the better greeting is Wa alaykum as salam or salamun alaykum. So we try to use the complete and the full phrase of the salam so we, could, we get uh, the rewards which is better than just a plain salam. What about at, uh, in like at university or at work? Maybe there's, there's uh, the opposite gender is a Muslim. Is it okay just to say salam to them? But only salam, we're not having initiating a conversation. But you know, if, you, if I'm at university and I, and I walk past one of my classmates um, and um, this person is a muhajjaba, she wears hijab, is it okay for me to say salam and keep walking? Is that okay? Well, the Sayyid says with regard to uh, um, initiating the salam, especially you have the young female, the opposite gender, it is makruh to initiate the salam. But if the salam was initiated from the other side, then it was wajib to respond back the salam. Unless if responding back would cause some kind of temptation or lust, which becomes haram. So if there's no need, then you don't have to have to say salam. Otherwise, if there was salam, then you respond back the salam, which becomes wajib. Shaykhna, in regards to... Um Suicide What is the Islamic opinion on suicide And what about euthanasia Where someone is suffering from an illness Like cancer or, or something Some illness which will cause death Are we allowed to uh, End this person's life Or can this person take his own life Knowing that yes I have a terminal illness I'm going to die Can he kill himself early Is that acceptable Committing suicide in Islam is not permissible haram. It's one of the great sins. And the one who 
is allowed to take the soul of the human beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Quran, it clearly mentioned, Allah yatawafa al-anfus hina mawtiha. Allah takes the souls when the one faces death. Only Allah has the right to take the soul of the individuals, of the human beings. You cannot take your own soul just because of illness or uh, severe situation in terms of health and or anxiety, depression, and so forth. We have to have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to be patient. We have to seek the means of dua, the means of asking others to pray for us to cure the situation, this anxiety, this depression, this illness, um, we're, not, we're not allowed to take our souls by ourselves in any how. Um, but we need patience, we need faith, we need uh, encouragement from others and dua. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reward us for uh, the situation that we're in, for example, anxiety, depression, and so forth, and the illness, that we gain the reward. So the more you stay in this dunya with pain, the more reward you get, the more clean you would be when you are taken to the hereafter, straight to the mercy of Allah and the paradise, inshallah. Hassan, thank you very much, Sheikh Nan. Thank you to all our viewers for joining us on this episode of Ahkam SOS. If you have a question you'd like to send in, send it to Ahkam SOS at imamhussein.tv and inshallah we'll be able to feature it on our program. Until next time, Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.